Hi, welcome to the school committee meeting of Thursday, January 26th. I'm Kiersey Allison Ampey. I'm the vice chair of the school committee. I'm standing in for Ms. Exton, who has a family uh, event to attend to tonight. Um, and with that, uh, before we get going, I want to note with sadness the passing of Mary Flynn, who was a retired 25-year employee of the Arlington Public Schools, who worked here on the sixth floor for many years and was the wife of late, the later, late Peter Flynn, a public works retiree. May we have a moment of silence? Thank you. So normally we would start with public comment. However, we have no public comment today. So we will move on to our student representatives who also are not present um, either by Zoom or in person today. And thus, our next item is the approval of the Model Congress field trip. Um, do we have... Um, I can speak to that. Uh, so you have a trip approval documents. Um, this is a trip that came to us a little bit uh, late, the teachers weren't quite aware of some of our procedures uh, with regards to making sure that we have some of this into you on time. It is an overnight trip, which is why it's coming to you for approval. It's a it's for the Model Congress team to go into Boston. They spend a lot of time doing Model Congress, um, and they work late into the night, and then they stay overnight in Boston. It's at no cost to the students, um, and it is over the February break, so it doesn't impact their time in school. Excellent. Move approval. Second. Okay, any further comments, questions? I, I just note, I knew that this wasn't, oh, we were trying for more approval, but when I heard about this, I felt like we've done this one before, it's in Boston, it, it, it was hitting yeses on all the things we normally worry about, so. Okay, all in favor? Uh, yes. Aye. Yes, aye. Any opposed? Okay, um, that motion, and any, <laughs> any abstentions? No, so that passes. Uh, six zero zero. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the AH, AHS program of studies. Mr. Danger. Doctor. So thank you for having us. Um, this is usually presented by Mr. McCarthy uh, because it is his labor of love and. Uh, um, although it is collaboratively developed with the department heads and the teachers, Mr. McCarthy is the one who really carries it out to the end, but he had a family engagement. So I get the privilege of presenting it today. I did just want to thank him and acknowledge that. And then Mr. Molnar is here because this is a longer than usual list of new courses, and he's, most of that is his fault. So <laughs> if there are questions, I wanted him to be able to speak to some of the great work that the visual arts department has been doing with the curriculum. Um, so a few things to note just about why we have sort of the number of changes we have. The new building has worked in some ways as we would hope it would. Um, and so it's created a lot of new interest opportunities, collaboration, new kinds of programming, um, and ideas that people have done. So the arts department in particular has really taken advantage of that. Um, so you'll look through a list of these offerings. One of the crucial things that um, also affects the program of studies is the elimination of the foundations of art requirement. So visual arts or a fine art, one year of fine art is a graduation requirement that can be met through the performing arts classes, it can be met through the visual arts classes, and there are uh, one or two facts classes that also meet that requirement. In order to take classes in the visual arts until next year, hopefully, students had to participate in the one-year Foundations of Art class. That was a curriculum A class. Um, in order to go on to any other advanced arts student had to take that, and then that met their arts requirement. And we've had a conversation over a lot of years about our sense that Arlington has a very strong arts program, um, that all of these different elective programs were strong, high-level, curricularly challenging <coughs> art programs, and only kids in the know figured out that you could step over that foundation's opportunity and go straight on to the honors level art. 
So this year, one of the biggest changes that allows for all of this variety is doing away with the Foundations of Art program. In the visual and performing arts, um, the entry level classes are curriculum A, and then the advanced classes are H. Since we did away with the um, entry level class, I just sort of wanted to be clear with everybody, the result of that is that our arts program is honors for all. Because when students come in at the entry level of art, they're taking an honor level class right from the start. Um, and so that may be something people would like to talk about more. There are a few classes, which again, Leo can speak about more, but I told him I'd do the short version in case um, you didn't want to talk about them more. But one of the exciting things that's happened in the new building are classes that are built out of collaboration. And collaboration is challenging given the way our contract works because we can't assign two teachers to one class unless either it's a very heavily staffed class or there's 40 kids in there. So these collaborations really come out of teachers stepping forward and working together programmatically. Some examples of that are the animation classes, which are being developed in collaboration between the computer science program and our arts program. Um, the mural painting and set design program, which will be run out of the makerspace, but obviously a collaboration from our drama teacher to make it so that the work that they're doing works in hand in hand with our drama program. Um, so that's the main course changes. And then in terms of policies, um, there's the wellness clarification. And I, I know there was some confusion, so I'll just address that. We have had a lot of the time sort of a misunderstanding, and we continue to work on messaging around this, around the excused absence policy. So the idea, as I try to explain it to people, is you have um, cuts, right? where a student is not allowed to be there and no one gave them permission. Then you have parent excused um, or non-disciplinary excused absences, which are not excused. And that's where people get confused. Your parents can excuse you because you've got a cold. That's considered an unexcused absence. But we have six options to do it. Um, so you can be out four days with a cold. Your parents can excuse you. Nobody has to go to the doctor. Nobody has to ask any permission. You can have a family trip. You can miss a day or two. Your parents can excuse you. There's no disciplinary consequence. You get to make up the work. You don't have to document it. It's only if you get over six that you need to bring in documentation, work with the deans, so that we know that students are getting appropriate care when they're missing that many days. So we've wanted the messaging to be clear to students that they have six absences to use flexibly or three in the case of uh, PE. So the change here in the language, which I think confuses some people, is that we've changed from saying, if you get seven, you will fail, to you have six that you can get before you fail. <coughs> so the language there says th you have three in a PE class because it's only half as long as opposed to six. Um, but it's three to use, four would cause you to fail. And then last, which is not in the program of studies on purpose, is something that we've all talked about in here a lot, which is guidance on selecting course levels. So based on the experience we had last year with the heterogeneous grouping initiative, mm -hmm. feedback that we got from the community, and then analysis of our own data around how students' performance was best predicted, our plan this year is to take out the step where teachers make a judgment call about whether a student should take A or H or AP curriculum and simply give people guidance on the things that we think most predict their success going forward. Um, we've tried to make it simple because there really are, you know, I explained this to the freshmen and I think they got it. I explained it to some parents. We've run it by kids and parents to see that people understood it. Because really the idea is if you're in an honors level class and you're getting A or B grades, which is meet standard or exceed standard, and, and this is important, you're not struggling with workload. You're not struggling with stress or anxiety. You're not having difficulty coming to school um, and being in school. If those three things are happening, then you're in the right level of challenge and you're meeting standard. So continuing on to the honors or AP level, if it's offered, makes sense for you. If you are at the B, at the A curriculum A level and you are meeting standard, then you probably are where you ought to be. And if you are exceeding standard, getting A, A minus, then you might want to consider moving up to the honors level challenge. 
but you want to take, want into, to take account. into account. You're getting A's, getting A's in the A's curriculum, in the curriculum A. A. You're doing, you're doing that, that without, without feeling, feeling overwhelmed by the weather workload. workload. And, and you're being, you're being able, able to attend school, school regularly. regularly. So those are those the three green things that we ask people, people to look at. at. The reason, the reason we didn't, we didn't put this language directly, directly in, in the program, program studies, studies, there's a link, there's a link in the program, program studies to this document, is because my expectation is that we will send this out to the world and there will be about a dozen or more misconceptions or misunderstandings of the language that we would like to be able to just revise for clarity rather than putting this in the program of studies where we would have to bring it back to the school committee. The idea is it's a flexible document providing guidance. The basic answer in the program of studies is you get to choose your level, that there isn't a recommendation. This is guidance on how to do that, which we'll modify if we get different feedback. Um, I will say that the feedback that we've gotten from eighth grade teachers and high school teachers um, is that people are very happy about this not being a responsibility, that they're telling you what you have to do or should do, that instead they're there as a resource to give students guidance as they're processing it. And I think that it will eliminate a fair amount of bias and relational stuff from those conversations because um, what we've seen is part of just in the heterogeneous pilot in ninth grade is that students are making decisions about what level they think they should be at based a lot more on kind of their preconceptions about who they are and where they should be as opposed to about what their current performance is and indicators that would make it successful. And I think that is everything that is in there. Yep, that is it. Questions? Questions, comments? Ms. Morgan? Did the eighth grade teachers, are they gonna have that same sort of guidance so that we're, cause like mm -hmm. from my experience the the eighth, your, your freshmen next year are going to talk to their eighth grade teachers down Mass Ave, right? When they're thinking about what classes. So the last, there's, there's a separate description for eighth grade. So mm -hmm. you go to the second tab. How should a student decide to take curriculum H, curriculum A in grade nine? That's the guidance that will, it, I don't know whether it's been shared with all of the teachers. I know within the departments they've had conversations and it's been <coughs> shared with the uh, administration in, in the eighth grade. Okay. And I see Julie nodding, so that makes me think that it has been shared with the eighth grade teachers. Great, yeah, that just feels really important, right? Because they're, they're really um, critical partners. Yeah, and they're, they're, there was editing, there was substantial editing that came back up. And that's why if you look at the grade nine examples, because there's actually only so many qu decisions to make, I actually gave an example for English, math, history, science, um, so that they can go through those examples. Great, and also I'm excited about the changes um, in fine arts. I was, uh, I was lucky enough to meet two of your art teachers, one in Whole Foods and one at Trader Joe's, um, over like a couple week period, and um, they both brought this up, and um, it just this seems like a, a really a helpful thing to do. It, it just allows students to get to those more, you know, specific courses much more quickly. Um, and I think, you know, we want we want them to take these classes because they're amazing and we have incredible space and incredible people. So I think it's great that we're doing this. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, first a question about the um, the change to the final exam policy. So I did, <laughs> I did email you that, but I sorted out the, uh, I figured out what you're doing. So you, you are eliminating the requirement for a final assessment, which you have this year, which is required to so be So for the 11%. last two years since yeah. COVID, we have not had, so if you don't have a high school kid, um, if you go into your high school grades prior to COVID, you'd have had a term one, term two, term three, term four grade, and then you'd have had an X1, the exam grade. That exam grade was 11% of your grade for the year. For the last nine years, the conversation has been that we wanted to move away from high stakes, low inference exams on the last day of school, right? An hour and a half exam that a teacher has two days to grade um, is by definition going to have to be easy to grade quickly if it's gonna be a comprehensive exam. So most of the departments have moved to final projects, summative assessments, multiple assessments leading up to the final. So the final day um, is not necessarily a day in which everyone's sitting down with a blue book and doing a blue book exam. 
It's a day in which people are wrapping up their final projects, presenting their final projects, uh, making sure that they've done final summatives, small, smaller assignments. Um, the final week gives people the opportunity to sit down, have a longer period of time to get through all of that, and then the afternoons give them time to grade, follow up with students who really need it, do makeup exams. So the final afternoons are spent with those three kids who need to be sitting there in your desk doing it, making sure teachers are available for the students to do that. So uh, we were just clarifying that language, um, that there is a summative assessment. There is summative assessment, um, but that the summative assessment may not necessarily be a sit-down exam, but it happens during those final weeks. Um, okay. So those, those days that we have in the schedule for final exams, for the majority of classes that are not actually no longer having an exam, are the kids still going to school yes. those days? Kids are ex required, teachers are required to be engaging in required substantive activities to wrapping up their summative assessments okay. on those days. But the picture we have in our head that I walk in there for my high stakes hour and a half exam right, right, right. is something that we've for the most part moved away from. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it actually, if you wanna be, um, <coughs> look at language, the language we have used, or I've tried to use, although sometimes others language slips into it, is it's called final week, mm -hmm. not finals or exam week. Okay. And they are final classes. Now I have a co couple questions on the, the R changes. So for students that are looking, that really aren't interested in, in either fine arts or visual arts, but have to fulfill this requirement, um, the foundation to study art class actually was a nice solution for those students. What would you recommend for somebody who's like not interested in doing a full year of painting, not interested in doing a full year of a specialty course to fulfill their, their requirement through the fine arts? Um, maybe it's a good time to um, Yeah, this might be a good time to just sort of lay out some of the changes because we've addressed that in a few different ways. Um, so firstly, one of the one thing I should say, the foundations course was a year-long course, and it was sort of very similar to what the student experience was in middle school or <coughs> in elementary school, where they were doing a little bit of everything. So we've taken that away, and what we've replaced it with is, is a lot of different things. So firstly, we've semesterized almost all of our courses. So now students, um, there's a couple, there's maybe one um, first level course called Studio Art that's sort of similar to what Foundations was, but it's optional, and that's year long. And then there's year-long courses at the end, you know, when students who students who have stuck with or done a lot of art and are thinking about either majoring in art or going to an art college, there's a couple of year-long courses at the end or preparing for the advanced placement exam. Um, those are year-long, but almost everything else in between is now semester-long. So the students who are, um, you know, just want to, you know, do not picture themselves with a career in the creative economy have lots of choices. You know, they can. They can take woodworking, they can take metal smithing and jewelry making, they can take animation. They've, there's a lot of wide array of choices that they can do within what was not the fine arts. Um, the, maybe I can just sort of talk through a little bit some of the other changes so you understand. Um, you know, our goals were one, to modernize our course offerings, to be, to kind of reflect the trends in the contemporary art world and the creative economy. The, the other goal was, the other three goals, one was to expand student choice and opportunities for specialization. The next one was to remove, remove barriers to make it easier for students to access higher level content much earlier. And then finally, as Dr. Jenga referred to, uh, to expand into disciplinary collaboration. So we've gone from actually 18 visual arts courses to 29 from th this year to next year. Um, however, that sounds like a ton, but it's not quite as many as it sounds like. So we do have five completely new courses. We have um, an animation program we're hoping to run, filmmaking. Um, we already have the facilities for this, so it's, you know, the, we have this amazing classroom full of wonderful computers and you know, green screens and, and a lot of the equipment. We just need the, the staff to, to, to actually develop the curriculum and do it. Um, metal smithing and jewelry making, uh, mural painting and set design, and then the final completely new course is called Senior Studio. So that's a class, traditionally students who are, are interested in going to art school or art major will take AP. We wanted to provide an alternative that's 
provides more freedom and is more in line with what goes on at, at an actual art college and, and more aligned with, so the students have some choices. They don't have to be follow the AP structure if they don't want to. Um, so the rest of the courses, so that's just five courses, the rest of them are were created by breaking up year-long courses into semester-long courses um, and by adding additional levels. So you know, we used to have just ceramics one and two, now we have ceramics one through four, et cetera. Um, and in a few of these courses, like woodworking, metalsmithing, and ceramics, that last level course, level three or four, is now is more or less of an independent study where these students have learned all the skills, they've learned all the machinery, and now they're coming in at different periods where they're actually learning, you know, getting a chance to really express themselves, but also be there that coach and, and peer mentor as well. Um, so that's sort of, um, you know, and then as we mentioned, there's a couple of different collaborations that are going on. We already have a science and, and art collaboration, which is design engineering, um, very much a STEAM course. And then there's the mural and set design, and then the math collaboration, where we're hoping we're going to teach who teaches animation, but also web design and game design as well. And brings some of those courses are pre-existing, but the idea is we'll bring the visual arts aesthetics into the realm of math and vice versa. Okay. And then last question is: so all of these classes last year, this year, are are the ones that you, you're continuing are, are curriculum A but you're changing them all to curriculum H. So could you give me some rationale behind that? Or the We're reasoning? not changing them. All of these classes are currently curriculum H classes. It's just that they can only be accessed right now having either taken foundations of art or gotten a waiver to extend into it. Oh, I'm looking at the program of studies and they're listed as curriculum A. In the current program of studies? They're all listed as curriculum H in the current program of studies. Talking about last year's program of studies? 22-23, yeah. Mm. I think so. Back and look. Mm. Sorry, take me a second. Give me a second. Yeah. I can add that, I mean, all of these courses are, um, you know, they have all these different levels of courses. So, you know, we have five different levels of courses here now. Um, but however, they're all incredibly differentiated as, as it is. So they're, right. they are, um, sorry, you, what do you find? They're all listed as A, but people took them. Huh. That's strange. You can explain. Um, yeah, but I just would add that, I mean, they are, the title aside, they are, it's so the art classes are so much about meeting students where they are and helping them realize their artistic vision. So there's a tremendous amount of coaching. And you know, you, you have students in there who have had years of outside experience and private classes in with students who are just learning the basics sometimes. So we already do a tremendous amount of differentiation and um, it's tremendously elastic, which allows for you know, that full range, whether we call it A or honors, frankly. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a greater conversation about we, that we've been having about what we mean by honors and what an honors class is and, and whether they're, you know, is everything at, at AHS going to be honors? I mean, now you're saying that everything in our art department is going to be honors. So I guess that's sort of a greater conversation to have as we move forward with these changes. So there was, so the conversation was, I was mistaken about this, but with the art department when they brought me in to have a conversation. One of the questions was that if we had all of these classes at the entry level be A, um, and in fact it appears that that was in many ways a devaluing of the art program in the past, was it really meeting that age curriculum? So we looked at what are the standards for an honors curriculum which are in the program of studies, what are the standards we're looking at in other heterogeneous classes, we looked at the standards that the English department has been working off of, and we had a conversation about Leo's rationale and the standard that the teachers wanted to hold the students to, and the agreement was that their goal was to hold students to that honor standard. Um, we then ran that by all the department heads to talk about how that aligned with their practices. You know, one of the questions was whether that, because that's different than the way it's currently in um, 
mu in the music program, right. um, whether people were comfortable that that was a reasonable standard, that that was a fair distinction, and that was where we ended up in terms of where we wanted those classes to be. Okay, thanks. Mr. Schwitzer? Yeah, I just, I just thought that the description that you had in the, um, uh, uh, regarding the, the choice uh, of this level as an individual decision, and this next sentence I thought was really good. While the administration makes the final approval of course selections, we generally follow the principle of challenge by choice. And I appreciate that wording. And, and, and I like having it here. I'd almost like to have that, that little block bolded. And I hope that everybody in the district and our parents and our students appreciate what it means that, that this district is opening up uh, seats for kids who have the desire to go and try. I'm, I'm impressed by the number of courses. I don't think it's the most we've ever I've ever seen uh, for new courses. So that's so congrats or, or and congrats on all the work that went into that. And I'm glad to see the AP um, African American Studies class added. That's a good. Thank you for mentioning that. I missed that one in my running through. I saw it and I I'm embarrassed to have done so. You know, good, good, nice, nice work. And then the, I had a tech. I had a question. We had a conversation here last meeting about approving. A varsity sport and somehow there was an impression that some, somebody said it, it could actually happen in the program of studies but it doesn't happen in the program of studies now that I'm reading this document so no one knows where we approve the varsity sport it just happens you, okay you, <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on the spot so, <laughs> so the answer is we've done it once before in yeah, we, my tenure yeah and we struggled to figure out what the process was um, okay. when the I will say having gone through the process where I think the budget committee discussed it and then they brought it forward um, we after that I I had a sort of change of heart in my our attitude about it which was that if it is an MIA my general sense is that if it is an MIAA sport mm -hmm. and we have sufficient interest to do it in the community mm -hmm. um, the ability to offer it and it doesn't cost more than we can afford that we should offer those yeah, I don't think it's a school committee decision. That's what right. I was trying it's to say. It's not very much money. I yeah. believe it's already been requested in the budget. Um, so I don't think you guys have to decide to do it as long as we can come yeah. up with the money. I, I mean, I, I don't mean to take us off. I, I, there was a conversation we would be looking at it in the program of studies, but that's not the case. It's not in the program. And I don't, I don't, I think it's your decision based on and you and the superintendent, <clears throat> I think. Is everyone nodding at me because I'll, send some emails tomorrow as a result of that. If, okay. if it's budgeted. And yeah, if it's budgeted. I think it's, yeah. yeah I, I, mean, think I, I, think other I think other formality under the MIA, MIAA rules, it should be approved by the school committee. But Well, okay, let's see. If the rules say that, then it's different. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's sponsored by the school committee is the language. I think that probably is a good idea yeah. in general. It, I mean, it, as long as it's, in the, it's, if it's listed in the budget, then I think that's, that can be considered our sponsorship. But... Yeah. All right. Would our process okay. then be to, okay. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to you to send it to a committee and then they bring it forward? Uh, okay. I think what we'll do is I'm going to. I'm ask sorry to take it off. Uh, take off. Liz Exton to add it to our next agenda so it's properly noticed and it's on an agenda and we'll just approve it there just to be sure it's very clear. And I think policy should. Uh, we should have a written way of doing this. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, if, 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 if the folks are going to come to us asking for something, we should have some way of acknowledging yeah. Yeah. Okay. that. And I think I appreciate Dr. Jinger that that. So I, I think the last time that we did this, there was some question about whether how much sort of pushing needed to be done to have it go right. And it, it this feels super different to me. This this one feels like there's lots of consensus so I, great I don't think we need dr. Dinger next time <laughs> in support of this we'll just I just want to be sure it's done by the book um, I actually as my comment would like you to talk about the uh, AP African American uh, course a little bit just so that people at home understand what we're doing so the AP is piloting a new course in African American history there are only 60 schools in the country that are participating in the pilot right now. Um, we were selected to do so. 
Um, it looks at American history from a, a, you know, the perspective of the African American experience. It is not um, going to have the AP exam piece at the end this year because that's part of the pilot. So you, you don't have that full thing. It's looking at the curriculum. We would count it as an AP on our, um, in our weights. Um, it's, a, I think, an exciting opportunity. It is something which there's um, controversy about nationally. The director of history and social studies is on the Zoom if we want to ask oh. her. Um, she'd need to be promoted, though. OK, I think. Right. <coughs> Can we do that? Uh, hold on. And, and this was not my work. This was the work of the teachers. She chatted. Caitlin Moran. She chatted as Caitlin Moran at 633, and now she is gone. So okay. she was on the Zoom. Apologies. <laughs> Thank her for bringing it forward. It sounds, it, it sounds like a really great opportunity for our Why? students. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hainer. Dr. Jenga, you said there wasn't yeah, a test, know, an AP test for that uh, because it's a pilot. Would the students get oh. credit for it as an AP course? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Well, that's supposed to be in the chat. We, that, they would get credit from us. From yeah. Not towards college. Right. right. Got right. it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anyone want to make a motion to approve the high school program of studies as presented? So move. Second. Any further comment? Oh, did you want to speak? Sorry. I just wanted to say um, that the work that Dr. Jenger and the team and Mr. Mjolnir has done on this year's program of studies is very aligned with the work that we're doing in the strategic plan uh, ahead of us even sharing it very widely. So uh, it's really great to see, and I'm really excited about some of these adjustments and some of the adjustments of language based on feedback. So nice job. Okay. Well, thank you. So if no further comments, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So motion passes 6 zero, zero. <coughs> I just want to warn you that I did just text Ms. Moran, so she might pop back on again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, we have the calendar, Dr. Hummel. All right. Give me one moment to what? Mm. I can't tell the circle length from the oval. I can't either. An A and E. Oh, this you're telling me that that oval. Give me a moment to share my screen. These ovals, these okay. circles are supposed to be different. Some are circles and some are ovals. Oh, really? That's how you distinguish. Okay. So I am bringing to you this evening, good evening, school committee members, um, some. Uh, Recommendations with regards to the APS school calendars for next year. We're a little ahead of schedule. I wanted to um, share some information about the calendars because I know that there are some community members who have been wondering because we sent a survey out and some communications about the work the calendar committee has been doing um, and they're wanting an update on what we're thinking. So we would plan to bring a first read of the calendar to you next week um, and we went ahead and put it on the calendar for this week with a little bit of room to present some of the data from the survey. So the agenda, I'm going to talk through the calendar committee, give a quick overview of what it is, uh, what we were looking at, and some context. I would like to share some of the survey results that we got from staff and families with all of you, um, my recommendations for the 23-24 school year, and some next steps that we'd like to take over the next year to make sure our calendar is, is, is <coughs> as thoughtful and inclusive as possible moving forward. So the calendar committee consisted of the members that you see on your screen. Um, all families and educators were invited to join or express interest in the fall of this year. We met six times, November through January, and we focused on three topics which the committee members raised when they came in. Um, they said they wanted to focus on religious holidays, uh, conferences like timing, format, frequency. And we also took a look at the format and readability we had made. If you recall, a lot of adjustments to the calendar's format last year. And we got a lot of feedback on that. Some of it was uh, positive and some of it was that it was parts were confusing. So we wanted to make sure that it was as readable as possible. Um, we focused on these topics in part because we had gotten inquiries from families and staff. Um, I have gotten inquiries from staff and families about why certain days are off and others are not. It's been a point of discussion in the past about the observance of particular religious holidays. 
um, not because of the religious holiday, but because of concerns about staffing levels and student absence levels. Uh, also because of ongoing conversations that we've had about the role of religious uh, conversations and celebrations in schools. And we have the ability to um, address certain topics in a non-bargaining year, but other topics we can't really address in a non-bargaining year. So that's why we focused on these. So to focus on the results a little bit, um, we asked staff a, a question in a staff survey about whether or not they would or would not work on a particular day if school was open. Um, just as a reminder, when we think about the religious holidays, part of the reason why school districts will take holidays as an observed day off is because they're concerned about the ability to open on those days. Um, either because they're not going to have sufficient staff to open on those days or because they're going to have so many students absent that it's not really a very quality instructional day because you can, can't really do tests or new material. You're going to have to catch so many students up later on. Um, we have a significant Jewish population in Arlington, and so we knew that we would have some fa faculty members who would say they would take a religious holiday on those dates on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, which are two observed holidays now, and Good Friday. For the sake of contrast, we actually added Christmas, and we added a lot of other holidays to the staff one, too, and I'll talk about the family survey and why we didn't, and in retrospect, what we're thinking about for the future. Uh, because it was a good point of comparison, actually, to have staff respond to whether they would come to school on Christmas, because it sort of gave us a numbers um, comparison. It, admittedly, we obviously did not have all of our staff respond. We had 410 responses of those here. Th these are the numbers that said that they would not work on those days. Um, and then I put a couple of comments uh, from each stakeholder group also in the survey uh, results for you to review. One staff member, and I will read these for, this, for the um, people who are watching from home. One staff member said, having established the Jewish High Holy Days as no school days for years now, and with the increased incidences of anti-Semitism in our schools and nation at large, deciding now to reverse course and have school on those days feels tone deaf. Another faculty member said, I would prefer fewer days off, especially in the fall, since it makes it difficult to schedule all of the students I have to see weekly or monthly per their IEPs. I would rather fewer days off and a shorter school year. So we had contrasting perspectives across the board, uh, which has informed the recommendation that I have for you this evening. Um, I'm going the wrong way. Let's go this way instead. Okay, so survey results from families. Um, we asked a similar question, indicate whether you would send your students on the days listed if APS schools were to be open. For, this, for the family survey, we only focused on the three, three days that we actually already close on. So we, we asked about Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Good Friday. Some of the reasoning behind that was that it was going to be extremely hard for us to ask about all of the holidays, um, and we were going to miss one. And we didn't want to feel exclusive, and really we were focused on these days, and do we have the capacity to operate how many students would be gone? <coughs> Uh, th these are the results. We had 892 responses. 160 families said that they would not send on Rosh Hashanah. 161 said they would not send their child on Yom Kippur. And 75 families said they would not send on Good Friday. Um, notably, the, if you look back at the staff results, I'll go back for one moment, the staff proportions on Good Friday were significantly different than the student proportions on Good Friday, which was interesting. Um, and perhaps just a, a reflection of the population of our staff versus the population of our students, but it was certainly notable. There are a notable number of students who would not be present in school on those days, um, and that is worth us taking into consideration. We also asked a question about the impact of elimination of days off for the specific re religious holidays um, that we had named on the survey. And the results of this are part of what has given me such pause as well as conversations with members of our community. So 37.5% um, of our families said that, it, that elimination of days off on those holidays would have a positive or slightly positive impact for their family. Um, and I'll show you some comments. They talked about a little bit about why as well. 24% said it would have a negative or slightly negative impact. 38 or about 40%, almost 40% said no impact. We've split basically into thirds um, of folks who say this would have a positive impact, a negative impact, or no impact. And I think that's worth further interrogation, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Here are some of the comments that we got from families on the survey, um, which certainly, like I said, span opinions on this topic uh, pretty widely. 
Um, and I'm, again, going to read them for the sake of folks re, uh, from home, so bear with me. One family said, my family is Jewish, and we observe the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It means so much to us that our children are not further alienated from the majority of their peers by honoring the high holy days. All the students having those days off sends a signal to the larger community that diversity exists, that we exist, matter, and are welcome here. Another family member said, we must either find and pay for child care, which is not easy to find, or a parent must take a vacation day so that our child is cared for. Vacation days have a quantifiable, quantifiable monetary cost that is significant. Those days also reduce the time we can spend together as a family. These three holidays, in conjunction with other special school days, cost a lot of money. Another community member said, As a rabbi with a student on an IEP in Arlington Public Schools, it is very important to me that our family's religious practices be accommodated. My son would get extremely behind and have trouble getting caught up if he had to miss three days of school in the first month every year just to absorb, observe our holy days. Another family member said, I really appreciate APS's efforts to address the religious holiday issue and hope whatever direction the district takes, it first and foremost acknowledges the growing diversity of our community, even if that means eliminating most religious holidays so as not to leave others out. And finally, another said, our jobs do not give us these days off and we get limited um, parental time off. Finding alternate child care for three children for these days is extremely difficult and we don't have family around. So that just sort of reflects a little bit of the thinking people were doing when, they, when we asked about impact, positive impact, negative impact. Um, and we know that those days off do have a negative impact on some families on the percentage that I just showed, about 37%. Uh, also that it has a significant positive impact for other members of our community. Um, so we also, I will just share this really quickly and then I'll go to my recommendation. We also asked about conferences. We asked about the best month for elementary conferences and the opinion seems quite split. Uh, we've been doing, we did them in December before. We're doing them in January now. Um, what this data tells us is that we could do them in December or we could do them in January. <laughs> like, um, there wasn't a strong necessarily feeling either way. I think December is a very busy month. So if we were to put them back in December, which is a pre prior practice, then we might want to aim for earlier in the month if possible. It also means that they might need to take place before the close of term, which is a little challenging because you don't have the end of term information in front of you potentially during a conference. Uh, we also asked about the potential value of an additional elementary conference. That's something that would have to be bargained um, and discussed with our teachers. Um, a lot of families, 39% uh, said that that, might, that would be very valuable. Another 26% said somewhat valuable. Uh, the calendar committee also talked about, you know, what that would look like in order to be valuable and, you know, what those conferences, what value they find in elementary conferences and length of conference. And we also talked about length of middle school conferences and the committee had some recommendations around that. We're not making significant, this, is, this doesn't really impact significant changes to the drafts that you have in front of you. Um, I wanted to share the data since we had asked those questions on the survey. So the calendar recommendation, um, for tonight and for this school year, uh, for as we prepare for next school year, will be uh, no changes to the existing holiday observances for the uh, school year 23-24 calendar. I had hoped to give you three years of school calendars this school year um, so that we could have three years charted out. I would like to delay the development of three years at a time for, an, for one more year to allow for further research and conversation, particularly on the topic of religious observances in Arlington Public Schools. Um, I, in the meantime, I would like to introduce options for child care for families during closure dates with the biggest impact on working families. Um, that would start this school year. I need to talk to our after school program providers um, and potentially some other providers in town about opening up a fee based um, option for families during on those holidays on Rosh Hashanah, Good Friday. Um, and Yom Kippur falls on a Sunday this year, so that doesn't impact us as much, and assess the cost implications of those options and whether or not we can subsidize partially or in full for low-income families. I would also like to assess the connection between early year absenteeism for low-income families and the impact of early days off on absenteeism, because one of the analyses that um, I w went and learned how to do, because I actually didn't know before this, was to look at the chronic absenteeism levels of our low-income families compared to our not low-income families. And right now, our not low-income, for this school year, our not low-income families' chronic absenteeism rate is about 12%, but for our families who are low-income and identified as low-income in our data, it's 24%, so it's double. 
And that's a pretty huge impact. Um, and so we need to better understand why that is the case, what, if any, impact some of these early days off could have on that. Um, and, uh, and it's possible that there's not any, but that there is certainly work to be done with some of our families who are income insecure when it comes to getting to school, because um, that's going to contribute to some of the gaps that we see and are in the strategic plan. And I also want to work with our Director of uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Belonging, and Justice on some conversations and affinity-based focus groups with Arlington faith communities and working families this spring and summer with an expansive focus on understanding how their religious identities are or are not recognized in schools, uh, what the schools can do to better um, support those families in their observances, whether that's through blackout evening dates where we don't do activities on certain dates through, uh, you know, informing the community and doing education in classrooms around what observances look like and how that can impact people, uh, informing our teachers about the implications of, for example, fasting um, or other religious observances. So we want to go and have those conversations, and I want to work with um, Margaret on doing that. Ms. Thomas. So the next steps would be to draft a school year 23-24 calendar. You have an initial draft that doesn't have all of the parts in it yet, um, and we're still finalizing in your materials for today. Uh, Arlington Public Schools will still have to, like I said, add a few things to that. I would like to discuss the possibility and logistics of vacation day programming with our after-school care providers, explore tuition subsidies for vacation care um, for students from low-income families, and plan some affinity-based focus groups like I just talked about. And I'm happy to take any comments or questions from the committee. Any comments? Anyone? Ms. Morgan. Um, will we be able to <laughs> leverage the 25th of September to help mitigate the impact of the move for the high school kids? That is a great question. I would have to go back and look at the timeline on that. Um, just in, I, I have the move calendar, but I don't have it right now. Okay. Um, possibly. Well, but it's not a day off though, because it's not because it's on a Sunday. The twenty. The twenty fifth is gray. Sorry. The twenty fifth of September is grayed out, which is right at that. It should not be. Oh well, yeah, it's it's. Okay. Yom Kippur. Twenty fourth. Hold on. No, it's the 25th. Okay, then it should be. <laughs> I went back and forth on this one because somebody told me it was on a Sunday. It starts the Sunday night. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why I was looking up. It's always confusing to me. Okay. But the day we have to have school. Yes, okay. So that, yes, that should. So yes, perhaps, but I need to go double check the timeline for the move. But that could be definitely utilized for move activities. It just seems like it could potentially allow the high school students one more day in the old building, which I appreciate. Nobody wants to be there, but we want our kids in school, right? So it could, it could, you know, it could reduce by one the number of days that we need to make up down the road. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then if we have um, feedback on the ovals or the circles or the boxes, should we? Send, I, 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 it's really hard. I will tell you, I had the whole January conference calendar wrong on my personal calendar up until the day before they happened. Um, so, um, it's it's I don't I don't know how you do this. I don't. It's really it's really hard, hard to streamline. We're trying very hard. I, I I appreciate that this screams to me like extraordinary and exceptional effort, and I think that that's fantastic. I. I will try and think about putting it like. Send feedback to Ms. Diggins. Ms. Diggins, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Anyone? Yeah, I was just gonna. I mean, the the circles versus the ovals doesn't doesn't work. So we have to, <laughs> have to find something different to distinguish early early release for all versus early release for elementary only. Because um, that's hard to figure out. Thanks. So what will happen? I think eventually. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Diggins, is that the A, the number in the circle will get replaced with an A or an E once we know what the all days are and what the E days are. Oh, so I there won't be a number there. Oh, It'll just be okay. A or E. I thought they were, you were distinguishing between an oval and a circle. No. It's supposed to be. <laughs> <if there's, laughs> 
<laughs> that would be challenging. <laughs> I think there's supposed to all be circles with either an A or an E in there. It's I just see. that we don't know which days are A's or E's yet. Okay. Mm. It's Keith. <laughs> Mr. Hayner and I are over here talking about election day. Um, I'm assuming November 7th is the full school PD day? Yes. Usually in non-election years, we do that on November 1st. Oh. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The day after Halloween is a great day to have a PD day. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That makes sense. Well, <laughs> we will move it. The following year, uh, November 24th, you're going to have a Monday and Tuesday, which is the 11th, which is a national holiday. The 12th will be the national election day. The following will be Thanksgiving. So November is going to get a lot of punches in it. In 24, 25. 20, yes. Cool. So now that you just got 23 okay. settled. Okay, we're not. Well, we're not going there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I won't be yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, we'll move that to that. Okay. okay. Um, Mr. Shuckman. Yeah, I, I mean, the one thing I want to say is that the old calendar was both ugly and confusing. And I know that. Liz Diggins has done a lot of work to try to take stuff from other communities and meld it into something that's uh, a lot more visually pleasing and a lot easier to, to understand. And the clarity of this, there's no good way to do this, but the clarity of what we have here before us right now is far superior to anything we've had in the past and probably one of the better ones that, that I've seen. Uh, as opposed to the train wreck that we currently run. So I just wanted to um, commend uh, Ms. Diggins for, I, I, know the, I know how much work she put into this, and, uh, and it's commendable. The other thing, just as a note on the high holidays, uh, <clears throat> Rosh Hashanah is the Saturday, which is the 16th of September, so that's not the day, that, that's the day we don't have to worry about on the calendar. Yom Kippur is a Monday the 25th, that may, creates a three day weekend. Thank you for correcting me. Mm. <laughs> and it's correct in the calendar, but it's, it, it's a little counterintuitive. Um, but uh, thanks, thanks. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. any further comments? So this is just a first read, we needed to see it, and you've heard some feedback and we will bring it next week, or yep. I mean next meeting. Yes. Okay. Cool. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so moving on, strategic plan. Okay. Moment. So I will not present a, a bunch of slides today. Uh, you have received in your materials a bunch more in initiative documents. Uh, in draft form, so we are open to and still making small adjustments as we go, um, but we have made it through the major effort of getting all of those initiative documents drafted in as close to one voice as we can manage um, to put uh, finances attached to the items that we feel like we can project approximately how much we think each of those action strands is going to cost. And what I will be sharing with the community, because we discussed having an open comment period, um, I haven't quite decided how long I think this open comment period should be, so I'm open to feedback on that. Um, but what I think I will probably do is publish this website, um, and I'm still adding some materials to it, to the community <coughs> with a letter that explains how the strategic plan uh, came to be and how it's laid out and what its components are. If you go to the site, there are a couple bars at the top that invite you to learn about the plan and the structure. It talks about how the plan was developed, uh, what is in the plan, and it lays out that um, graphic that I had showed you the last time we met that explains that there's one vision and mission, four priorities, 12 initiatives, uh, what is included in the initiatives. And then if you go back to the home page, there is an area for each of the four priority areas. Um, priority area one clearly lays out those focal groups that we had discussed and has links to each of the initiative documents. Um, what I'm hoping to add to the home page is a video that walks through each of the priorities and explains them um, to some extent, probably explains what the major strands of work are too, like goes down to the strand level, which are those milestones that are in each of the initiative documents. and 
that is a way of asking families to sort of engage with the plan without needing to go and read all 12 documents, which is sort of a laborious task. Um, and then invites them to fill out a form for public comment telling us what they think we should include, what they don't feel like they heard about, that they were expecting, um, that we might have missed, uh, any sort of notes that they have about details that they hope in implementation of the plan they will see happen in the schools and use some of those comments to further tweak and refine and improve um, upon the documents that you have received. So that is where we're at. That is what we're working on right now. Uh, as you have time to go through each of the initiative documents, I would really appreciate getting some feedback. I appreciate some of what I have received already, and we're continuing to make revisions to some of the documents as we go. Um, so if community members are in the document and they see somebody typing, they shouldn't be surprised because they are live and currently changing documents. Um, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to take a little bit more time to get some more community input. It will probably take me another couple of weeks to make a video and get it translated because um, I do want to make sure we post this in as accessible a way as possible and our vendor takes a little bit of time to turn videos around. Those aren't quick. So I will take any questions that the committee has. Questions? Mr. Schwartzman? What's our timeline going forward? That's part one of the pieces I actually was seeking some feedback on, how long the committee thinks a public comment period uh, would be, and then we would need to, uh, I, this is a plan that I would imagine we would vote into policy, so uh, something that maybe a subcommittee would take. Um, CIAA has been looking at it throughout the process, so it might make sense for that committee to initially give it the, the final uh, stamp and then send it to this committee for the final, final stamp. I would imagine I mean, I, I imagine my suggestion would be to leave it open for at least a month once we get the video up and send everything out to families, um, and then maybe vi revisit as a subcommittee. But we can, we have flexibility. It doesn't officially start till July one. Because I really like this, but I haven't really had a chance to go yeah. and study it. I mean, it's it's just the first draft showing up, mm -hmm. and just sort of getting a sense for for my purposes and for everybody else out there, how much time we're going to have to think about it and. Uh, absorb it and maybe look for little tweaks and mm -hmm. make it really even more wonderful. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Okay, I'll make one now since somebody else is popping up. I think in terms of timing, one of the main things we need to decide is are we going to approve it before April or after? basically before the election or after because mm. we're going to have a somewhat different board composition. Um, I think I think we should do it before. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Fielman. Yeah, I, I think we should do it before. Number um, one, and number, number two, if, the, if, it, if, it, if the curriculum subcommittee meets and it looks like we're gonna get to a point where we're wordsmithing the document, I would suggest that we do what we did last time for the mission th and have a kind of a retreat in your office mm -hmm. to go through it. Because if it gets to that level and we're wordsmithing at this mm -hmm. table, it's not effective. Mm -hmm. It's not a good use of people's time. Okay. Do you know wordsmithing? Cool. Mr. Cardin. Yeah, I mean, I think it's in, it's in excellent shape already. <laughs> I mean, I think if people it, have to take some time while she's recording her video to go through it and see if they have any uh, substantive changes or even technical changes. Um, uh, Dr. Holman is really open to, to adjusting things, um, so I don't anticipate the need for wordsmithing. Um, That's what I said. If yeah. you do, yeah. Okay. If you do, yeah. In our then, committee, yeah. yeah. Then let us know in advance. Committee. We should have a we should right. have we should have a retreat. Yeah, I don't <coughs> think we need a retreat, but yes. And and we haven't heard what the community has to say right. about it, right? And they may have totally different take on it and yeah. make us make. Dr. Homan adjusts things a lot. So, um, okay, so definitely before April, um, we can sit down and, and talk about some dates, or, or you and uh, Ms. Exton can. Um, I guess one question I have about this is just in reading through the drafts, I was unclear how the costs work, whether they are all on top of each other, you know, so they're each they're each separate costs, or whether some of them are 
duplicate, you know, there, there's the same bundle here and there. This was the subject of much debate. Um, so we, we were struggling with, do we write it, the costs in as uh, like the assumption that the following year, those things are now in the budget. So what's the add on this year, right? Or are we, are we mapping out the entire cost of the plan? So if you put a position in in year one, you're gonna see that position again and again and again in the cost out for the five years. We did it the latter way. Okay, but I meant for priority one and priority two, if they have something that kind of overlaps. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm not necessarily speaking to the right ones, but yep. there were some things that overlapped. I wasn't sure are the costs that are mentioned in priority two already in priority one? Yeah. Or are they? We only put the cost for a thing in one spot. Okay, so, so we add up all the costs to get the total correct amount. Yep, and where that happened, I tried to put a note in to fund, like see the strand above or see the initiative yeah. 1.2, mm -hmm. the costs map onto this strand too. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And then some of them seemed like there might be cost savings in terms of other positions in the district. Are those already included or are there savings that would be realized that are not, that we don't see in, in this document? So I would think about the cost of the plan not as fully, and we're working on a, a spreadsheet right now that actually does a full cost out and like totals it all at the bottom. Um, but whatever that cost out is, it's included, parts of it would be a, re a readjustment of things that we already do. So it would be spending money that we already spend in maybe a slightly different way, which would be to say there are efficiencies within the system that we're using to, to supply the plan. Those are not included in that cost out. So this is us saying this is the full cost of the full plan, some of which is gonna re require additions and some of which is gonna be wrapped into how we do budget planning over the next few years. So we're gonna plan strategically because we have this plan, we're gonna plan the budget strategically in alignment with the plan. Okay, let me just make sure I understand. So the full cost may not, the whole thing may not cost what that full number is because there may be efficiencies which will cover some of its cost. Correct. Okay. Okay, anyone else have any questions about this? Great, okay, so we, hope our audience will take a look and there will be announcements and videos and translated videos and <coughs> things coming in feedback forms coming mm -hmm. soon um, next superintendent schools dr Holman. i don't have any updates to the goals that you looked at for our first read last meeting okay does anyone have any comments on the goals see none would anyone like to Move, I move approval, approval of the goals. Second. <laughs> okay. Uh, any further comments on the goals? No. Nope. Just get it done, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know how it I'm goes. On it. Keep us posted. <laughs> Go from there. I was going to say, I like Mr. Cardin's form. I thought that was very nice. And I <laughs> really appreciated that form. Thank you, Mr. Cardin. Sure. <laughs> very much streamlined things for me. Okay. So, all in favor of the superintendent's goals? Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That passes 6 0 0. Uh, where are we? Okay. So, the next is now the agenda reads possible vote to accept the FY24 budget allot allocation. I would edit that to possible vote to acknowledge the FY24 budget allocation. Um, the number is $88,947,334, which would be our allocation from the town. Um, that is the number that has been given to us by the town manager in the latest long range plan. And there's many things where it may change, but. Right now, that's our number, and that's the number that we're going to be building our budget or on. Uh, can I have a motion to acknowledge that number? Uh, move to uh, approve with the acknowledge. or acknowledge. As amended. <laughs> okay. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> <laughs> 
Any further comments? Mr. Schluckman? Was, was this discussed at the uh, uh, budget meeting earlier? There, yes. There, yeah. Is there anything emerging from the budget subcommittee meeting of relevance to this vote? No. Okay. I assume that one of the outstanding items that, which has been talked about is the amount of state aid. And that, yes. That's the, the thing yes. that might adjust the number. Okay. Yeah. No. And no. Well, yeah. or what? Whether or not the town chooses to go for an override mm -hmm. may change things, mm -hmm. but we don't know, and we won't know for a while. But right we're now. we're solid that this. We're solid that this, this is the number that we're building. A floor. This is this is the number we're building our budget on. We're not going to have any regression. Okay, thank you. We acknowledge that this is the number that mm -hmm. Mr. Pooler provided Dr. Homan, and we're, I am grateful for her mm -hmm. so, so just, yeah, so, so maybe just get some background. So mm -hmm. we had a, we, the override included a four-year plan, which ends in this fiscal year 23. This number continues the assumptions of the plan, the commitments to the plan for another year. Mm -hmm. So it includes a 7% increase in special ed, a 3.5% increase in regular ed, um, the, the uh, enrollment adjustment amount, and which was what was negotiated last year, which was were declining amounts of funds for a COVID adjustment. Mm -hmm. Last year was 900, I think. This year is 600. Mm -hmm. Next year goes down. The year after it goes down to 370. Mm -hmm. So that is all in the in the in the number that Kiersey cited. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed. There was some discussion of, of making changes, but nothing has been changed. Mm -hmm. um, there are maybe some people who want that number to be reduced. There may be some people who, you know, once state aid comes in, we may we may request it an, an increase. Mm -hmm. But um, the Town manager's budget is printed with that number. Our budget will be built around that number for now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that post that motion passes six zero zero. Moving on, superintendent's update. So I want to start by um, sharing that we did our January set of instructional rounds as an administrative team at Gibbs and Hardy. I, we had a lot of positive feedback on this one um, and that it was the best yet. And I credit that to the fact that teachers joined us for the first time. And it was a lot of fun to have teachers there. So what happened was we had three teachers from Hardy join us at Gibbs and three teachers from Gibbs join us at Hardy, which made for a lot of fun conversations um, because it sort of takes them out of their context and get to look at a new school and uh, meet some new people. So we uh, focused on the benefits and we are focusing for the year on the benefits of academic discourse and strategies for ensuring equitable engagement and contribution to classroom discourse. We're using the book Academic Conversations, which has a lot of really concrete strategies for building discussion norms in classrooms and talking norms in classrooms, um, which is how students build content knowledge uh, and we are obviously looking to have really engaging classrooms where students feel the agency to express their ideas and every single student is having a voice. And so that's what we're looking for this year in our uh, instructional rounds. I'm very grateful for the teachers who joined us and for having them um, with us. And we're thinking a lot about how to expand this practice into the schools, give teachers more opportunities to do this with their colleagues. Um, and I know a lot of our ILTs are focused on that and are trying out some new things this year. So uh, I also had a quick, uh, update on COVID-19 illness and absences. We are seeing a decrease in our absence rates, um, which has been great. And coming back from the break, um, as I said, we had fewer than we were necessarily expecting. And that has that trend has continued. We have had a couple of instances where we've had some COVID-19 spread in a classroom or in an LC. It has been um, isolated to a particular classroom or LC in most cases students test at home and they're symptomatic and call it in and so we don't have um, a lot of necessarily concern about it spreading a lot while they are at school there are after school events there are things going on on the weekends in those cases we issue uh, notice to families and let them know that there's an uptick in COVID-19 cases it's not an outbreak 
the, the term outbreak has very specific public health definitions attached to it. So these are not outbreaks. They are us noticing an increased incidence of people reporting to us that there are COVID-19 cases um, in a particular area of a school, like a learning community um, or a classroom. And so we try to make recommendations and notices as, as local as we possibly can, because we don't necessarily want to be disrupting learning with mask recommendations um, or changes in practice where we don't have to. And so I know that families have had questions about this, about why some of our practices have changed since earlier in the pandemic and just wanted to give a brief update about our protocols and policies. We do check in with the health department every time we have one of these instances just to make sure that uh, we're aligned in our messaging and what they would recommend. I also wanted to give an update on deputy superintendent search. Um, we are uh, moving right along this week. We have had a lot of activity surrounding this search this week. We've done initial interviews, as I reported last time we met. The finalist round is almost completed. That round has included um, two school visits for each of the candidates, with students, teachers, and administrators um, being visited at each of those sites. Uh, they have the opportunity to go into some classrooms, interact with students. And one of those is not completed because one of our candidates had um, something come up and wasn't able to make it to their scheduled visit. So we're, we've rescheduled that candidate for next week. Um, our afternoon and evening forums were this past week. They visited with central office staff as well on Wednesday and completed a finalist task with the cabinet team. Um, they visited with their potential direct reports, the curriculum directors and a couple of administrative assistants who currently report directly to the assistant superintendent. Um, and then I'm going to be doing individual meetings with each of the candidates and reference checks over the next week or so. Uh, the goal is still to have a recommendation to the school committee on February 9th. And I wanna thank the members of our community who have participated and provided very comprehensive feedback, which we're still looking through and sorting through. And people have been very thoughtful about this and dedicated a lot of time to it. And a lot of people have. So I just really appreciated um, the time people have given to this process, as, including our candidates who have spent a lot of time with us this week and gave up a lot of time to consider this role and are an exceptionally, exceptionally well-prepared group of candidates. We're, we're very lucky. So it'll be a hard decision and I look forward to letting you know what it is in a couple of weeks. And that is all I have to share. Your enrollments are in your materials and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions about the update? No? Okay. Uh, moving on. Mr. Mason, financial report. Good evening, school committee members and uh, those that are maybe watching remotely at a later time or right now. Um, Tonight, you know, I'm going to go over the finances as of December 31st, 2022. Um, and it doesn't want to move for me. Okay. And so, in the in the reports, um, this this the slide deck is going to be a condensed version. Um, once again, you would have found more reports in the full report packet that's also in Novus, which includes reports on the general fund, grants. Uh, the grants that are, were carried over from prior fiscal years, um, COVID-19 related grants, uh, the electric bus related grants, and uh, special revenue and revolving funds. Um, we'll start off with the general fund. Um, we're, we're, getting, we're spending the budget, uh, I guess as planned, but there, you know, we still had some uh, balance remaining from once again, from vacant positions, that's going to be uh, probably be stated every uh, time I, I produce a report for the remainder of the year. But um, at right now, we're at total spending of around $32.7 million. Um, we're encumbered with salaries and, um, you know, outside vendor uh, obligations around $47.8 million. And what we're projected to spend was, was remaining in department budgets are around $3 million. And there are some pending transfers and expenditures, um, one-time expenditures that uh, we anticipate to, to, to happen. Um, that's around $567,000, um, which some of those include uh, 
a transfer from ESSER 3. There was a literacy coach that was being charged to the grant that we originally budgeted part of the grant that um, we see that due to vacancies, we can be able to then move those expenditures over to the general fund and then possibly use some of these dollars for a fiscal 24 budget. And fiscal 24 is the last year that we could use ESSER 3. Um, we have a couple months in fiscal 25, but it really has to, we should spend it down in fiscal 24. Um, it also includes athletics, uh, athletic stipends that were posted to the revolving uh, account where we previously had posted revenue collected for fees. Since we're not collecting fees, it should not be posted there. So that will be uh, um, moved over, as well as um, any other applicable expenditures related to uh, instruction that's on the foreign tuition account. Some one-time expenditures that we're including is um, in here is uh, a project for possibly the Audison and Bishop um, audio-visual projects. They're, they're outdated equipment in those, those spaces and we believe that you know they'll have at least a life, uh, a life, a useful life cycle of about five years so if there's any talk about a new Audison um, that's not a worry. Um, and then um, also looking at re-envisioning, uh, using, using some funds to design, um, for design for re-envisioning Bishop and Stratton main offices, which would, uh, which would allow us to make additional office spaces and also look at improving building, secur building security at the entrances. So that in result leaves us with a, a balance of about $300,000 at the, the end of the fiscal year. This slide is uh, the budget versus actual based on the budget transfer categories. This is just based on the categories that's outlined in school committee policy DBJ. Um, and um, you would have also seen uh, actual versus budget month by month um, or by month. And what you'll notice that actual in December is higher, but it's not necessarily uh, and overspending in that month is just that that month had three periods pay periods and so majority of our, our budget is salaries uh, that's why you still see that and all the budgetary numbers is evenly spread out across 10 months so that's why that the budget number is not matching or reflecting that extra pay period then we'll talk about special revenue and revolving um, overall um, we, we had a starting balance of the core funds. We have other funds, but these are the core funds that we're talking about around $5.1 million. And we've collected about $1.4 million at this point. Um, and our expenditures around one3 leaving us with a current cash balance of about 5.2 on hand. Um, we anticipate about $1.9 million additional collected, mainly between our, uh, our after-school rentals and circuit breaker. Uh, we have three more payments to collect which we'll use for next year. And then we do have about 1.7 million of encumbrances and we're gonna have credits hitting those accounts based on the, the, um, the athletic uh, expenses and some uh, foreign tuition expenses that will be moved to the general fund. Last but not least, just an overview of just the core grants. Um, we had about 2.5 that's been awarded to date and uh, an additional 832 that's been identified uh, for from the prior year. Um, and so we're gonna continue to spend and work on spending these down and I thank you for your time and I will uh, leave it to the chair to allow any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Cardin. Yeah, I get some of that projected spending that you were talking about, I don't, I don't think we've, we've discussed it at budget. I don't know. It would, it would be good to have a plan for that reviewed at budget and it may may have to come up to the full committee if it crosses over the allocations yeah. before we actually spend it. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I'll, I'll put that on our next agenda. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is no consent agenda. <laughs> Uh, next is subcommittee liaison reports and announcements and I am first up with budget. So we met this past week and we did strategizing for the next long, re long range plan as well as hearing updates on the budget process which is underway 
and uh, is expected in a couple weeks. And um, we will be meeting again February 10th. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> Community relations. Uh, the school committee chat for families of color, January 28th, has been rescheduled to March 4th. Okay. Um, curriculum assessment, instruction. We haven't met, but we probably need to. So we'll we'll make them. We'll have a meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, facilities. We're trying to schedule a meeting after we schedule another meeting for something else, but we're going to do that. We're going to schedule a meeting the next week or two. Look for an email. Okay. <coughs> Policy. Guys, we'll be no report. High school. Can we do it on site at the parcel? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, actually? Uh, high school. High school building committee meets on uh, next week. No, the following week, first Tuesday. Yeah, it, all is going well. Okay. Uh, superintendent evaluation. Nothing. Ways on reports. Announcement. I, I have lots of liaison. I've been liaising. Oh, I've been oh, yes. liaising. <laughs> I've been liaising all week, as it turns out. Um, let me see. Where did I go first? I went to Envision Arlington, um, where. Uh, I believe it was members of the standing committee. I, uh, I, I think they're trying to figure out where their, what their path forward looks, sounds, and feels like. And so there was a lot of conversation. Um, I'm not super familiar with their work, so I didn't feel like I brought much to the conversation, but um, I did. So anyway, I'm not sure where that's going. Uh, I also went to the wellness committee um, and we are still working away at that wellness policy. Um, some interesting things came up around um, food in schools um, and uh, recess and withholding recess. Um, so I did, I, I sort of have continued to tell them that it's going to be sort of a lengthy endeavor to move that policy through our policy subcommittee and then here, because the changes are, are pretty significant. So when it gets closer to a time where it's gonna be done, we have one more meeting with the DESI representative um, to make sure it's all legal, and then um, we'll make sure to work with Mr. Schlickman to push that through. Um, so yes, that's it. I think that's all the liaising I did. But it was many hours, actually, of <laughs> liaising. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Hainer? We're on announcements? Yeah. Okay. The Rotary Club of Arlington will be having its annual polo dip to raise money for polio vaccinations at noon this Saturday at St. Camilla's parking lot. And you're all invited. <laughs> <laughs> Not Should to go in to watch. Should I bring ice cubes? Somebody is already bringing a bucket of ice cubes. <laughs> I'm going in. <laughs> it's, a, it's an inexpensive cardiac exam. If you survive, your heart's in great shape. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we hope you survive. Yeah. Um, You're going to be a pop? <laughs> yes. Thank you. I think he's a grand popsicle. Grand popsicle, grand pop. yeah. <laughs> um, anything else? Any future agenda items? Mr. Schuckman. Uh, yeah, first on the announcements, just to make note that the Arlington Education Foundation will be having their uh, innovation showcase. Uh, on next Monday, January 30th, from 6 to 8 at Punjab Restaurant, and rumor has it the superintendent will be speaking. Um, and there'll, there'll be food, but they're requesting a donation. But it's a worthwhile thing to do, and it's very worthwhile to support the AEF because the money you donate to them comes back into the schools and does great things. And this is a recognition of that. And for future agenda items, I'd like to have an update on implementation of policy ECEV. E-C-E-V. E-V. -E oh, okay. What, what is it? Electric vehicles. It's electric oh, okay. vehicles. Oh. E -C okay. Okay, that's all. Um, anything else? Hearing none, move to adjourn because so we'll, there is, there, we don't have any, uh, we didn't, we don't have anything, we don't have anything for.
executive session, so move to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. <clears throat> okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Nope. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you.